please, uh, yes. please uh, welcome. This is the third of the roundtable series of webinars that, that we've been hosting. Um, and our roundtable series is really designed to bring together people who are running projects, uh, crowdsource transcription projects on From the Page, that are connected via some kind of theme to talk about what they're doing in their projects, to share tips, um, and hopefully to, to provide experience that the rest of us can learn from. Um, and uh, these are moderated by Bethany Radcliffe. And I will, uh, Nancy Ellis is joining again. I will uh, turn this over to her then while I'm in the uh, waiting room. Yeah, so with this webinar, we really wanted to highlight in particular uh, records and collections on From the Page that are documenting the lives of African Americans for Black History Month, um, which as probably most of us here know, most records or a lot of records documenting African Americans have been very limited in access um, over the years. And so we wanted to highlight projects that are doing the work and highlighting these stories and building better ways to access these materials. Um, so with that, I will give a little introduction for our first speaker, who is Dr. Camille Westmont, who's actually joining us from the field today, as you might have heard. Um, she's the visiting professor of history at the University of the South, and she'll be discussing the convict leasing project, which is a project seeking to document convicts imprisoned and forced to work in Tracy City, Tennessee, between 1870 and 1896 by the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company. And I have a video um, that I will be playing that Camille sent. Let me share my screen really quickly. Apologies for all the tabs, but I will make this bigger. Um, let's see. Okay. That looks great. Can, I, can you see it? Awesome. I'm gonna click play. Tell me if you can't hear it, um, but it should work. Let me go to the beginning, okay. You don't have sound. I don't know that there is sound on it right now. Okay. My dad had a photograph of the stockade. Before dad got that photograph, I have no idea. That's one of those questions like thousands of others I wish I had asked him. But as far as I can remember, he always had that photograph. So he had it for many, many years. And it must have been a big deal for them to have got a photographer to come up and gather all those people around to make that photograph. stockade was a branch prison and they brought convicts to Tracy City to mine coal and work at the coke ovens. Not many people knew that there was a stockade. My dad, when I was growing up, uh, many Sunday mornings he'd say, boy, let's go walk to the stockade. People don't know about that sort of thing because it's, uh, it's a sensitive subject and uh, it's not the kind of thing that people generally want to talk about it, even if they knew about it. And after a certain amount of years, people don't know about it unless they dig for it. The Lone Rock Stockade was specifically built to house prisoners who were part of the convict lease system. Convict leasing was only made possible by the passage of the 13th Amendment. In school, we're often taught that the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, but that's not exactly what it did. The actual wording includes an exclusion from that, that ban on slavery. So specifically, people who have been convicted of a crime in the United States of America can still be legally enslaved for the duration of their prison sentence.
as convict leasing intensified in Tennessee and the prison populations, the African-American prison populations in particular, exploded in the 1880s and 1890s, the Lone Rock Stockade began to house many, many more people than it was originally intended to. So an area that was originally intended to imprison between 200 and 250 people became home to over 600. In the state of Tennessee, there is an incredible archival record related to convict leasing. Specifically, the state of Tennessee still has all of the records about who the prisoners were that were sent away to these branch prisons under the system of convict leasing. Things that, that has always really struck me about this photo is that when you zoom in on, on the prisoner's face, he just has this, this thousand yard stare. When you see that photograph and of that convict surrounded by all those people with guns and all the authority, and he's in his stripes, his zebra suit, as they call it, he had to be terrified. And Whatever that convict did to cause that much of a commotion and that gathering of people and a photographer, if he hadn't already had it, he was probably in for a strategy. This is undoubtedly uh, the, the prelude to, to a lot of suffering and, and potentially his, his demise. The brutality of this place cannot be understated. And the man in that photo knows that. And that's, that's the look on his face. Identifying the man in the photo might be possible if we can contact a descendant uh, or if we can find additional copies of that photo that have, have more, more information associated with them. Um, I, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I am saying that it will take a lot of work and a lot of dedication uh, to, to identify that man. I visited that stockade area so many times, and usually I'm alone, and it's weird, but sometimes I stand there and I can almost close my eyes and I hear, I hear all the noise. I hear the convicts, I hear the chains, I hear the mules. I can almost imagine how it was. And I think about that convict in that picture a lot of times when I'm there. And I know by the trenches that are still in the ground, I know about where that was. But if you stand there and have read a little bit about the history of the convicts there, if, if you're not touched by it, I just can't imagine how it could be. That was really a great video and so cool to get that context. Um, Camille, I don't know if you're still here and wanted to add anything, um, but we can also collect questions for Camille if she's not able to join um, for the Q&A. And I also wanted to share um, a link to all the project pages today. So let me grab the link to uh, the project that Camille works on with us. And you can see, there's a lot of projects from Sawani, but if you scroll down, the convict leasing pro uh, projects are the ones that were being talked about today. Um, so yes. uh, yeah. I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah, so so thank you for, for showing that video. It, um, 
I think it really conveys, you know, the power of, of this history and, and what we're doing. And of course, um, when the video is talking about those, those records from the state of Tennessee that list every prisoner who was enslaved by the state of Tennessee between 1870 and 1896, all of those records were, were in the process of transcribing through from the page. Um, so I'm just incredibly grateful for, um, yeah, that, that this, this, exists. Camille, can you tell us some stories about kind of how your process of transcribing is? I know you've done some partnerships with some local genealogy societies. Um, kind of expand on some of that. Yeah, precisely. Um, so, so of course, we're, we're out here in, in rural Tennessee, and there's some interest in the history, but really, if we're going to get uh, get these documents. We're talking about thousands of, of pages of names. Uh, we're we're going to need a lot of help. And so I've been incredibly fortunate that the Nashville chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society has um, has been an incredible partner in, you know, helping to host transcribathons, um, building public interest in this work. And uh, and yeah, so so we've hosted I think we've done uh, one or two transcribathons with with OGS. We've done a couple locally, and um, they've been really well attended. So at this point, we have over five thousand names transcribed, and uh, and we're the number is is growing every day. That's amazing. Awesome. Well, I will move on to our next presenter, who is also who is joining us asynchronously has a recorded video for us. And this is Tanea Kuntz, who is actually the president of the Afro-American Geneal Genealogy and History um, Organization in Nashville, um, and the Tin Gen Web board member and creator of the Academy of Legacy Leaders Facebook group. And Tanea will be discussing her project on the Tennessee genealogical indexing uh, from the PAGE project which has been using from the page to crowdsource more than 9,000 names and counting from historical newspapers. Um, and let me get her video. Kania is also one of the partners with, uh, with Camille. Yes, so it's kind exactly, of with the Tennessee Genealogical. <clears throat> okay, can you see this, the video? To okay. join live in the conversation Tanea. and in the webinar. So hopefully this recorded, in, this recorded present. Here we go. Hi, my name is Tania Coates, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with you information about our Tennessee Historical Newspaper Indexing Project. I do regret that I'm not able to join live in the conversation and in the webinar, but hopefully this recorded, inf this recorded presentation will give you insight into what we're doing and how the project is going so far. Now, I am working on this project in collaboration with a good colleague of mine, Billy McNamara, who I believe is also present at the webinar today, so she can answer any questions that you have um, after I'm done with the presentation. And you can also feel free to email us um, and contact us through the project website. So I'll get started for the sake of time um, and just take you through the steps of what we're doing. Now, I wanted to start with an example of why this project is important. Now, this is an image of a rather tongue-in-cheek depiction of the phrase, needle in a haystack. <laughs> but working with newspapers is very much like needle in a haystack. Sometimes it can be difficult to find the information you're seeking. Well, let me show you this obituary. This was published in 1850, and it's an obituary for a woman named Mrs. Martha Pettit. This is um, one of the obituaries that was indexed from the early phases of our project. And I just drew it at random because I was curious, how discoverable is this obituary currently? And what I learned was that it's not very. There are more than 80 individuals on Ancestry, for example, that have her in their tree. None of them had her obituary. The newspaper is digitized and available online at the Chronicling America website, as well as newspapers.com. Well, searching for it would probably not be very successful because the optical character recognition that's been done on this particular obituary doesn't have her name correct. There are no published books of anyone who's gone through McMinn County newspapers to look and pull out details of individuals that are named. So at the current state, it can be difficult to locate this obituary. 
but we have now indexed it and it is now part of the data we're collecting and our volunteers are making obituaries like this more discoverable. So that's particularly exciting for us. Now, to carry out this project, we are fortunate that we can leverage on a long history of genealogy volunteerism. Billy and I are both involved with the U.S. Gym Web Project, particularly the Tennessee Gym Web Project, which is a volunteer-driven initiative to provide genealogy information online for free. All of this information comes from volunteers. Our websites are coordinated by volunteers. So our community is very familiar with this concept of just genealogy goodwill. On top of that, we have had initiatives such as Family Search's indexing, which has been doing crowdsourced indexing since 2006. And they've coordinated and facilitated some very large projects, such as indexing the 1940 census and the upcoming 1950 census with a strong reliance on volunteers. So the great thing about our genealogy community is that they're used to this model of crowdsourced approaches to index historical records. And that is good for our work. This is the website of our Tennessee Newspapers Project on the From the Page platform. So what we are doing is loading issues of historical newspapers into the site so that our volunteers can index names and organizations that appear on the pages. Where is this data coming from? How are we sourcing our newspapers? Well, I can tell you that we are so fortunate in that the Tennessee State Library and Archives has been intentionally collecting and microfilming newspaper issues all across the state of Tennessee for decades. So they're microfilming the newspapers and we're able to leverage that. Now we're starting off this project with some of those microfilm issues that have been digitized and made available online, but we are doing this project in partnership with TSLA. So we will be able to get to the microfilm records themselves TSLA will continue to do more digitization, and we can include that into this project for our volunteers to work with. So we're incredibly thankful for all the hard work that the Tennessee State Library and Archives has been doing, because without it, this would be an even more monumental task than it is. This is a screenshot of what it looks like for our volunteers when they come to the site, and we pull up their digital issue for them to look at. And rather than transcription, we're doing indexing and we're leveraging the spreadsheet template that From the Page now offers. And this is particularly exciting for us because it allows us to be very specific in the details that our volunteers will capture. So we're presenting to them the spreadsheet that includes the column the name appears on or the organization name appears on. If it is a personal name they're capturing, we want the prefix, the given name, the last name, the suffix. We have a way for them to indicate if a person is described as not white, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more, whether or not there's a photo, and we have a category for article type. So these are 11 different categories that we've come up with that allow our volunteers to give a little bit more context to the name or organization that they're capturing. We're very excited to be using the spreadsheet format because it's really been the basis for how we're able to carry out this project. I want to take one moment to talk about how we're documenting persons of color, right? There are a myriad of terms that have been used over the decades to describe um, individuals who are not white. And we want to be able to capture the fact that a person is described as not being white, but we do not want to reuse some of that vocabulary and some of that terminology. So we elected to go with the checkbox option. So when a person is explicitly described as not being white, our volunteers can check that box. This is helpful for the researcher because they can look at a name and look at that field. And if they're researching African-American families, it helps them narrow in a little bit better if they see that this checkbox is checked. At this stage of the project, we do not have African-American newspapers loaded, but we are going to be doing that soon. In Tennessee, we have some options that we can choose from, and we will be including as much as we can. Um, and this includes Maryville Republican in East Tennessee, the Chattanooga Blade, and a, you know, a very long run newspaper is the Nashville Globe, which was an African-American newspaper published in Nashville, Tennessee from 1907 to the 19, to 1960, I believe. So it has a very long run and was of critical importance to the Afri African-American community. In fact, 
an analysis of the communities covered in the National Globe, published in Mid-Tennessee, just gives you a feel for how extensive their coverage was. And this is a map that was created of issues from 1907 to 1918. So as we think about their publication into 1960, we know that this coverage gets even more in depth. So you have a paper published in Middle Tennessee that's covering African-American communities across the state. So for anyone who's from Tennessee and from an African-American family, having access to a human curated and human uh, pr provided index is going to be incredibly helpful. Now, what's going to happen to this data when we're done collecting it? We are so happy because the Tennessee State Library and Archives is going to be incorporating it into one of their online web databases. The data will be made available for free for Tennessee researchers to use or any researcher who's connecting to their Tennessee roots to search and leverage. So the work of all of our volunteers is definitely part of this genealogy goodwill. It's going to be made available for free. Now, before I conclude, I want to give another example of how impactful having this type of index can be. This is an obituary of a woman whose name was Mrs. Uh, Mary Mary. She was the wife of Reverend Nelson Mary, who was the first ordained Black minister in Nashville. And when she passed away in 1917, there was a huge write-up about her in the Nashville Globe. Now, even though this issue has been digitized and is available online, Getting to it can be a little bit interesting. So the fact that we're going to be able to name index it will help anyone who's looking for her or her family. And of note, in this particular description of her life, they mention her parents. And they mention that her parents were free. They were not enslaved. She was born around 1827. So this is definitely during the period when most African-Americans in the country were enslaved. So to be able to access this newspaper article and learn this detail about her can be helpful to a researcher. In fact, if I go look at the 1830 census for that county, I do see a Edward Jones listed. Now, whether or not it's her father or someone else would require additional investigation, but just think about the possibility of someone who is researching, finds this information about her being from a family that was free and having the opportunity to go look at other records to help see if they can investigate that further. Incredibly impactful to have an index that enables us to do this. To give you an update on where we are so far, it's been phenomenal. Our volunteers have indexed more than 300 pages because the numbers on our site now do not reflect data that we've already pulled down. And even though it says 7,000 index records on the screen, it's actually more like 10,000 at this point. So we've been engaged in this indexing process for about two months. And for us to have 10,000 index names already, it's just, it's just indescribable. So we know that as the project grows and more volunteers come on board, we're going to be able to have an even larger impact. So I thank you for your time today um, and letting us share this project with you. We are excited about it and are looking forward to seeing it grow and having even more impact for Tennessee researchers. Thank you. I wish Tanea was here because that was so awesome. And um, we are going to share this recording of the overall thing with her so she can see this. But that was really great to um, to see. And I think it highlighted the the impact of um, you know, indexing and transcribing and also collaboration being a huge key. Um, even thinking back to Camille's project and how she collaborated with Tanea to verify some of these names and get information, I think is super impactful. Um, you know, what I love about this project is Tania and Billy are they're pushing this data back to the Tennessee State Archives, right? They're like, this is important. We're going to do it. I really hope you have a place for it, right? <laughs> Which is, is not the model of archival engagement that we historically see, but I think it's, it's really? so amazing. And Tennessee is so lucky to have people who are, are pushing the engagement and, and working so hard to, to, to find all these names, 10,000 names. I mean, that's great. Uh, Debbie Ann had a comment in the in the comments, the chat section about um, that um, the Staten Island Staten Island was mentioned in the Globe from Tennessee, and this is one of the things we find. It does not take that much material to start finding the overlaps, mm -hmm. right? Stuff overlaps all the time. You know, we have what a million and a half, less than a million and a half pages transcribed on from the page on 
tons of different types of projects and the number of places they overlap is amazing. So I think that's just really, really cool. That is really cool. And it'd be cool to like push it even further and do some like location mapping or something like that with that data. Um, okay, let's move on to our next presenter. Um, so this will be uh, Gabriella Leon, who is the history and archives history archives manager at the Staten Island Museum, and Debbie Ann Page, who's the co-president of the Staten Island chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. Um, and they will be presenting on the Access, Collaboration, and Equity and, Geneal and Genealogy Initiative. Uh, Ace Gen, which brings together Staten Island Museum, the Staten Island chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, and Frederick Douglass Memorial Park to digitize and transcribe records related to family history research on Staten Island with a special focus on communities that have been underrepresented in the historical record. So with that, I will let them start their presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Uh, I think the two preceding presenters have my wheels turning already, so I'm really excited to be a part of this. Um, you introduced the project so well. Uh, Debbie and Paige and I are working uh, with another group, Frederick Douglass Memorial Park from Staten Island, on the Access Collaboration and Genealogy Initiative. Um, I am, as Bethany said, Gabrielle Leone from the Staten Island Museum. The museum was founded in 1881. We're celebrating our 140th anniversary this year. Um, and we have a general interest focus, so natural science, art, and history, um, mostly related to Staten Island and the New York City area. Staten Island's one of the five boroughs of New York City. Uh, and you can learn more about us on our website at statenislandmuseum.org. Um, and with that, I'll introduce you to my colleague, Debbie Ann Page who's the co-president of the Staten Island Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so the Richard B. Dickinson Staten Island chapter of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, or we say Staten Island OGS, was organized in 2016, and we actually received our charter February um, of 2018. We are a 501c3 membership organization, <clears throat> and we're open to the public. We uh, Pre-COVID, we met regularly at the Staten Island Museum every third Saturday, um, except in July and August when we were uh, on vacation, and we hope to be able to resume those meetings again soon. So we're organized, I think, a little differently than um, some of the other chapters where we focus more on the people destinations rather than, rather than the um, place um, uh, for example, we um, we look at um, the African diaspora, the African American, the Afro Caribbean, the Afro European diaspora, and their family histories, as opposed to just say a place based like New York or or Staten Island, um, more specifically, because um, we have members as far as of, as far away as Georgia. Um, and so yeah, and so. Uh, we have been fortunate in, in our ability to um, to be able to bring in members from across, um, you know, from across the country. We're hoping to um, reach out and do it internationally as well. And so a little bit about the um, cemetery is uh, Frederick Douglass Memorial Park was opened. It was organized and then opened in June of 1935. And the New York Age announced it as a 53 acre ultra modern cemetery on the south shore of Staten Island. Um, it's but the um, the major focus for the newspaper to um, to announce it was that it was controlled by African Americans. Um, Interestingly enough, though, it was organized by African-American um, funeral directors from Harlem and its headquarters was in Harlem. So the story of Frederick Douglass um, brings um, a sense of um, understanding about Staten Island and the people who are buried there, but it really is another story. It's a story of Harlem as well. And I think the, the connecting um, tissue there is that it, it spans across um, this, this, this bigger place. So uh, the Asian Initiative is uh, funded by the New York Community Trust, um, and it brings together these three organizations in a really exciting collaboration 
to digitize uh, archival co collections that are relevant to genealogical and historical research. Um, so those are city directories and business directories from the Staten Island Museums collection and burial records from Frederick Douglass Memorial Park. Um, where making public records from 1935 to 1971-72, um, because records 50 years or old, 50 years or older, um, are the ones that are allowed to be in the public uh, for public access. Um, so some of the records that um, are digitized, we're using Internet Archives Tabletop Scribe to digitize our records. Some of the records that um, are published and are able to be OCR'd and are already searchable are already available on uh, the Staten Island Museum's Internet Archive page. Um, so those are the city and business directories from the turn of the 20th century. So the 18, around the 1860s to the early 1900s are available right now. Um, and more of those will be added. Um, but the records that are handwritten we've decided to go ahead and take the extra step to, to transcribe. And that's where From the Page has been such a, a fantastic partner um, in this project. So we just began, we kicked off on Sunday, um, last Sunday the 13th, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, but first, just a, an introduction to what the records are, what the types of records are that we are working on. And so we're, we're looking at um, transcribing three types of records. They're the index cards that were created um, for a publication by Richard B. Dickinson, who uh, our chapter is named after. He was the first um, African-American borough historian for Staten Island. Um, the permanent record books and the, um, and the ledger books for Frederick Douglass. The uh, indices are really interesting. Um, they pull out census data and they put them on these cards. And while the book is published, uh, it's it's out of print and it's difficult to get to. And so the um, having these particular cards up is gonna be a geneal genealogical um, gemstone for, for, for those who are looking for African-Americans on Staten Island. The permanent, um, the permanent books or ledger, uh, uh, are the um, the funeral directors uh, the the purchase of the um, uh, the burial? The, I guess it's the burial uh, uh, um, records. And so you have the the dates, the um, cert uh, death certificates, the name of the person, the last address, age, um, uh, gender, the person who owned. Um, the grave itself, where the person is buried, and the funeral director. Um, and, and this is really going to be um, really interesting. I think one of the things that we did last Sunday was that, you know, I, uh, as a genealogist, I couldn't help myself. And I went down this rabbit hole looking for the first um, person who was buried there uh, on line one. We found them in the New York age and in the announcement. And then, you know, we found the death certificate on ancestry and we were able to kind of climb down a couple of roads. We found the World War II death, uh, uh, World War II um, draft records. And it was really having the ability to see these records this way is going to be really um, helpful to, to historians and genealogists in the future. And the last are the ledger books, which um, basically is the day-to-day um, accounting for the burials. And we're really excited to be using the spreadsheet format for both of those um, types of records. Uh, our transcribers seem to be really excited about it because it gives them a little bit of a direction and a little bit of structure uh, for the records they're transcribing. The permanent record books, as you can see, whoops, are, um, um, are a one-to-one -one transcription. So we've just recreated the spreadsheet uh, in the template, but um, the ledger books, all of the data is there, but it's sort of haphazardly entered. Um, and so the spreadsheet really formalizes it um, and has been helping our transcribers um, find what we're looking for. Um, also, like the internment column, even we've been able to put a drop down 
uh, with choices. So they seemed to really enjoy that last Sunday uh, when we had our kickoff event. So we had a hybrid program, uh, the Staten Island Museum's first hybrid program, uh, last snowy Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, and we had 40 people in attendance, um, about 20 online and 20 in person. Um, all generations participated. We had uh, some groups represented. So the, the National Council for Negro Women from Staten Island um, participated. Staten Island Ogs, of course, participated. And a few people who found us uh, and were interested in learning more about the project. Um, we've had, so of the 40 people who signed up and worked with us on Sunday, I believe 11 have been working still this week. So uh, about a quarter, which is great. Um, and so we think it's only gonna grow from here. Um, and with that, I'll say, please join our team at fromthepage.com slash Staten Island Museum. Um, but we have a few of the groups that came on Sunday have reached out to schedule some transcribathons they might wanna do that we can introduce them um, to the project. I've reached out to some schools on the island, high schools and colleges. Um, so I think there's a lot of potential um, to grow our team. Um, and we're really just thrilled about how it's grown so far. So thank you so much um, for letting us talk about it. Thank you for sharing. That was really cool. Um, and I really, I liked the example of the way that the indexing is actually bringing structure to some of the difficult to transcribe materials. And I think that, you know, that's a really interesting way to think about the way indexing can be almost like something to help transcribing become more user friendly. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that's really cool. Um, and maybe sometimes it makes it more difficult. I don't know, but I will uh, turn it over to Lydia now. And Lydia Naroth is the project manager of Virginia Untold at the Library of Virginia. Um, and she will be speaking about uh, the Virginia Untold project, which is a project that provides digital access to records that document some of the lived experiences of enslaved and free black people in the Library of Virginia's collections. Um, I will turn it over to you now. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you, Bethany. I am going to share my screen um, so I can share this. Um, and I really enjoyed that segue because um, I'm going to be talking about indexing as well, in addition to kind of explaining the Virginia Untold project. Um, and I just want to reiterate that I've really enjoyed hearing about everyone's projects. And there's, of course, um, some really great overlap between the work. Um, so again, my name is Lydia. I'm the project manager for Virginia Untold at the Library of Virginia. Um, and I do just want to give an introduction to the project itself. Um, Virginia Untold uh, does provide access. It's a digital portal sort of um, to records that document enslaved and free Black people in the Library of Virginia's collections. Um, the project began in 2013, many years ago, really as a naming project to go in and index um, records that have material related to this history, um, kind of surface that material and then digitize it and make it available online. But the project has um, evolved in, in many ways over the years, um, most notably kind of in recent, a couple years ago in February 2020, when we received the NHPRC grant to hire a project manager, who is me, um, to focus on two two um, separate tasks. One is digitizing our free black registers um, from different Virginia localities, which I'm going to actually spend most of my time talking about today. And then also to process um, a lot of material from the city of Richmond, one of the localities that is just currently underrepresented within our database. Um, and really, I, I see the hiring a project manager, hiring myself as a way of moving the 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 project, which wasn't really a project from a digital collection to something that thinks more holistically about how we do this work. Um, how do we engage different audiences? How do we collaborate? Um, how do we really focus on outreach? Um, so that's kind of where I'm thinking of the project moving and I'd really like to see the work go. Um, and I think transcription is such a huge part of that. So I'm really happy to be able to um, talk a little bit about that today. 
And so um, as Virginia Untold currently exists, it's a website. Um, if you guys haven't checked it out, please do. Um, the website will be changing soon, I'm happy to say. It will be much more intuitive and hopefully user-friendly. But um, the way to access those records now is from the Search the Narrative page. There's several different ways to search um, by name or locality or record type that provides you access to those digitized documents um, within the library's collections. Um, but what I really want to focus on is uh, one huge part of the project, um, which is digitizing our free black registers. Um, so those of some of you might be familiar with um, what these materials are. Um, in the 1790s, the Virginia General Assembly uh, passed an act that required all county clerks to register their free black populations um, and record them in books in the courthouses. And this included name, age, um, identifying marks and typically how they were emancipated or if they were freeborn. Um, some of these registers even go so far as to document things like former enslaver or where these people were born, um, providing a lot of genealogical and identifying information. They are an incredible resource. Um, I also just want to mention because I've heard so many, um, uh, so much about this in other projects just now is, I mean, this act is really, sort of representative of the state of Virginia wanting to control its, its Black population. It is a kind of direct representation of um, trying to control these, th these people. Um, and if you were found and you were not registered, you could be put in jail. So again, we see those ties to um, incarceration, early mass incarceration of the Black population, which I think is just really fundamental to point out. Um, so that's just to say that these are really valuable resources. Um, the Library of Virginia has about 37 of them in our collection, and part of this grant is to digitize them. Um, and we've actually done that. They are now digitized. Uh, we've just recently got the scans back up, and they will go into From the Page and be transcribed before they go into Virginia Untold um, with their full index transcription. Um, in addition to the registers that we have in our current possession, we also want to work with clerks throughout the state of Virginia um, that have them in their local courthouses and either um, collaborate in a way that helps a, that allows us to accession them into our collections so we can preserve them better or leave them at the local level and uh, obtain scans so we can digitize them and also make them available. Um, so that's just to say that we're trying to think about this in a comprehensive way. How do we provide access to um, these materials uh, at a full level? And so we've had a lot of success with the Arlington County Free Black Registers. Um, these are already up on from the page. Uh, we actually worked with a clerk before we got our grant to sort of test out to see how this would go. We ended up um, acquiring them, conserving them, rebinding them, and then digitize them. So we recently launched these on from the page back in October around a transcribathon. Very successful. I think promoting it in that way was very useful and um, is largely why they are almost completely transcribed. Um, as you can see, they are uh, what I call freeform or paragraph style text. So with the exception of some indexing that really threw people off, um, it was a very straightforward project. It, I think it made sense to a lot of our users. Um, but what, what we've had to grapple with recently is that um, not all registers are created equally or the same way. Um, so as you can see, the image on the left here is from Amelia County, Virginia. Um, this is uh, this this image here lends itself to a very traditional style of transcription. Um, we're asking users to transcribe verbatim everything they see on the page. It makes sense. Um, on the right, though, is an image from Southampton County, uh, the Free Negro Register. There, it looks like a modern day spreadsheet. It's a ledger style. Uh, many of us are familiar with this with this problem. Um, so we knew this was going to be an issue. We talked a lot about it. Um, of course, in from the page, you do have to set your transcription style at the collection level. So we knew that we would have to put all of our free black registers that were free form into one collection and all of our um, ledger style registers into another collection. And then talk about how we would do the headings for the ledger style. They're not all the same. Um, how would we mix it up? It was 
it was a lot. Um, it was kind of a point of conflict. How are we going to do this? It was kind of holding up our process as well. Um, we really want to make these available as, as quickly as possible. And we've, we've gotten a lot of requests for them. There's another issue too that um, even within the county level, sometimes uh, registers are recorded differently. So uh, the image on the left is from Westmoreland County in the early 18 teens to the 20s. And the one on the right is in later years, either a different clerk or the clerk changed their mind about how they were going to record these free people. Um, and so even setting that at, you know, if we were to split a county level, I think that um, that's confusing for users. If you're thinking about groupings and organization and how people are accessing these materials. Um, so again, just something we were trying to work through. Um, and so finally, we sort of had a, what I call a come to Jesus meeting, where we're talking about it as a group. And it was actually Sonia Coleman, um, the head of our transcription projects, who suggested you know, why don't we think about how we are extracting the data? How do we, why don't we think about what we're going to do with the registers? And so um, it shifted us to think about how we could actually index it instead. So instead of doing verbatim transcriptions, um, asking users to treat all of the registers the same way and go through and extract the data that we're looking for. And that's kind of what we've landed on. Um, so I went through a sampling of the registers and tried to pull out all of the fields um, that were recorded. Even if some don't have those, just a, a kind of a full comprehensive view of all of the, the possible fields that might be recorded in some of these registers. And then present um, you know, our users with, uh, in the same way, the freeform register alongside of the spreadsheet pulling out that information. Um, and so where we are now is we've um, actually set up a test group. We've, we've pulled a sampling of about seven registers, images from seven registers, and asked um, staff to test these internally, to go through, transcribe a few pages, and see how it works. Are the headings intuitive? Uh, do they make sense? Um, what is left out? We've also talked about various fields that we can make drop down menus. So things like locality we can uh, control for, or gender, I think is another one we could probably do that with. Um, how are we going to do the date formats? So that's kind of where we are. Our user, our test group had some really great, helpful feedback for us, and we are going to uh, make those updates to our headings and um, instructions too. Instructions are going to be really important in this particular scenario making it very explicit to our, our users and our transcribers um, what the goal is. The goal is to index. We're not looking for you to transcribe every the and and but on the page. Um, we're trying to get data from this and ultimately this is where the data is going. We're thinking about putting it in the Virginia Open Data Portal. Um, we're thinking about how it's going to show up on the website and I think cluing transcribers into that conversation is going to be really fundamental to the success of the project. Um, as I was talking with Sarah about this earlier, um, I think that this will be a cognitive shift for some of our transcribers who get really, for better or for worse, in the weeds about all of the data, they, all of the text they see on the page. They want it to be a verbatim one-to-one uh, -one. and we're asking them to do something a lot different. But in the same way, I think it's gonna engage a different type of user in that process that really enjoys, like some of you all have said, this indexing where you're just kind of, um, I don't want to be flippant, but it's sort of like a treasure hunt. You're pulling out that information and it, it's it's satisfying in many ways. Um, so we are, we're, we're, we're going to go with it. We're going to see how it goes. Um, and I do want to be cognizant of my time. Uh, so maybe I can answer questions from the group if um, those come up, but that is my, that's my spiel. Awesome. Thank you so much. That was really cool to see how you're able to incorporate such diverse documents into the project by kind of isolating those important metadata fields that, you know, are across all documents. I think that was really cool to see. And I bet there's other people that would be interested in doing something similar that are wanting to do indexing. Um, so I think we're going to move now to a Q&A time for everyone uh, that's here in person. And um, it looks like Victoria has a question for uh, Lydia and others who are doing indexing instead of 
straight transcription. Um, she says she would love to know more detail about how you plan to integrate data into your CMSs um, and wondering if you've done a test ingest yet of that data. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is a very technical question that I am not going to be able to answer. Um, Sonia, if she were on the call, I think would be more useful um, in answering that question. Um, so we're not quite there yet. Um, so I could probably maybe answer that better. And I don't know if Ben or Sarah are able to speak to that. Um, but I'm so sorry. I <laughs> that's out of my that's out of my pay grade. <laughs> but Library of Virginia has a data portal too, right? You'll be creating a yes. data set, which is a different model entirely from what a lot of other libraries and, and archives do. Um, and the idea that if you're if you're doing more of an indexing project, that you can create things that are are data which is kind of just a different thing than just an index or something that you know someone searches and finds and reads, right? Yeah, and I'm happy to drop a link to the Virginia Open Data Portal into the chat because that is where um, most of our, our data sets end up from Virginia Untold. And it's a different way, obviously, that scholars use the information. Um, so we're just trying to think about, think about that long-term. But LVA is great at just pulling anything into searchable indexes as well. <laughs> so they have a lot of different places that they, they put that. Um. Are there any other questions? I have a question if you guys don't mind me asking one. Um, so one of the things that I am cognizant of and like wondering about, there's a lot of difficult things that you encounter with these uh, materials, traumatic things, imprisonment, like, you know, who knows what really horrible things. Um, how do you handle encountering this and, you know, potentially transcribing it or dealing with it yourself? Um, and maybe as a follow-up, how do you prepare like future users to encounter this material? <clears throat> I don't know if anyone wants to answer that. <laughs> we know there was some coverage of Camille's project, which I think is is the one that has the most trauma in, in its material. Um, mm -hmm. There was that newspaper article that went into a lot of depth oh, and they yeah. talked about working with Tania's group and, and doing a transcribe-a-thon and, and taking a moment of silence just to kind of, of mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's honor or or acknowledge the, the many, many people who died, many of whom were very, very young. Um, in these convict leasing, this particular convict leasing project. Um, and that was suggested by a transcriber, which I thought was was a very appropriate and, uh, but also it takes, you know, sympathy and empathy to say, yes, this is obviously the right thing to do in the middle of this, this project and event that we're doing. Yeah, I was going to mention um, something I didn't touch on, but these free black registers record skin color and complexion, um, which can be really heavy, um, really heavy that um, if you think about a white public official passing judgment on what someone's skin color or someone's race is. Um, in addition to identifying marks, um, it's just a very personal, um, you know, process that's happening and I think can be very traumatizing for a user um, and or a transcriber and I don't have a good answer to to how that how you create comfort in that moment or how you kind of couch that in a context I really like the idea of a moment of silence to sort of recognize these as human beings and like taking a step back and saying these are not just words on a page so let's take a moment to realize that this was a person and they can't be summed up in this in this line of text here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think Tanea is um, kind of delving into the way that they used a checkbox for non-white um, to avoid kind of reproducing the harm that could come out of those terms that um, are offensive. I think that's like an interesting way to think about that as well. Um, We've also seen, you know, People don't have to be comfortable, right? That is not, <laughs> nothing says that you yeah. have to make people comfortable. Um, and 
facing historical documents and looking at them and reading them and transcribing them is how you know you will learn more about your history that has been whitewashed or or glossed over especially when you when you stop and realize like so many of our transcribers are 60 and above right their experience of history is not the same as someone who is 25 um and you know you have to sit with that discomfort and face your own history so that you don't repeat it definitely yeah i would i would say also um you know along the lines of what sarah's saying i think it's important that uh maybe there's a disclaimer to um make people aware that there may be some types of language that people aren't used to um but i think it's you know in in light of what's going on across our states in terms of what we can talk about what we can't talk about in a in an official setting in terms of school i think these kinds of projects really bring um you know make it important that that a, 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 a large swath of peoples can access this information and learn the history. Um, and, you know, if, if you're young enough to be able to use a computer, um, you can you can do these things. But again, you know, there has to be some kind of disclaimer because if a child comes across this kind of information without some kind of parental supervision, it, it could pose a problem. So I think that's something that Gabby, maybe we should be um, considering as we move forward with the language. Um, additionally, I know that for us, our transcribers have met with um, just the notion that just finding empathy that a baby, you know, is 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 being buried. Um, it always brings a little bit of sadness um, into it. And so, again, um, you know, you're you're working on cemetery records, so you know that you're going to meet with these things. But when you find it there, it, it, it's important to take a minute to just kind of um, let that kind of wash over you and and feel the empathy of of what that must have been like. I was going to say, I think empathy was a a big part of the discussion on Sunday, um, even in the preparation for the project. One of the interns who are, is working on it was doing some. Um, transcripts, sample transcripts, testing the instructions, testing the template for me. And she came across uh, in the census card, um, a family in a house. So a father, a mother, presumably, and three almost adult age children in like the 1860 census. And then by 1865, the father lived on his own. Uh, and she said, you know, she was transcribing in my office and she said, oh, and I said, oh, what happened? And she said, um, well, this this man, like, I think he lives on his own now. I think his wife died and I think his kids moved out and I feel bad for him. And that's only five lines of vital information, right? And that's the kind of connection that um, she was able to have. And some of the transcribers on Sunday said similar things. So I think there's really something to these projects for um, discovering uh, people, our ancestors in the past and what they experienced. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I just want to mention that we are at time. Um, I'm happy to stick around and other people have questions, um, but we can also go ahead and close out. <clears throat> Were there any other questions? Yeah, if the, if, the, if the speakers are willing to stick around a little longer, um, if there are questions, I'd say Victoria has her hand raised. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think she's clapping. Oh, clapping. Okay. <laughs> Zoom lounging. Yes. Awesome. Well, I just want to say thank you to all of our speakers for awesome. joining us. I'm sure Ben and Sarah would say the same. Um, it's been, this has been awesome to see. Um, yeah. We really appreciate everyone's time, especially on President's Day, um, and and everyone being willing to share your experiences and stories yeah. and projects. I mean, we 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 learn so much from these. I I, I love these because like what y'all are doing is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.